Hello everybody, my name is Taylor Ray. This is my LS Miata drift car. So, last time we went over this build from start to finish. Basically, starting with a turbo 1.8 beat up shell car. We stripped it down to a bare shell. We swapped in the 5.3 aluminum block truck motor, the CDO 9350Z trans, the Ford 88 diff. Uh, we got it painted, caged, everything. So we went over that whole build up until the point where we took it to our first drift event and we blew it up. So, this is kind of the version two, I like to call it. So, there was a lot of things that I kind of skipped over when I was building the car originally because I wasn't really sure like how I wanted to do it. I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole and basically end up spending like three years building the car because I got caught up doing this and that. And it's a lot easier to stay motivated when the car is done and running and driving and you've driven it than when you have a mountain of work to do. So, the motor blowing up was a good opportunity to fix some things that I had thought about doing when we were building the car and then other things that I figured out when I was driving it around a bit. There was things that I didn't like, I did like and whatnot and things that just didn't come out as good as I wanted. So this was a really good opportunity to redo them, get the car dialed in and then we spent a bunch of time after we got it back together dialing it in more and more and more. So basically once we got back from blowing up the motor, we took the motor apart, we checked it out. Look at that one. Whatever cylinder this is, is gonna be worse, same. Oh, this one's even worse. Look at this. This is crazy. I've never seen one like this. The motor is pretty trashed and the fastest way to get the car back on track was gonna to be to buy a complete motor and put it in, which doesn't really go quite as planned, but we end up making it work. So here is the version two build overview of the LS Miata. So with the motor being as far gone as it was, uh, it was one of those things where yes, we could have sent it off to the machine shop, yes, we could have rebuilt it, but I really wanted to get this thing back up and going as fast as possible. So the plan was to just buy an engine, throw my cam and springs in, and go. So while we were waiting to find an engine, while we were searching for one, we started ripping apart the engine bay. This is one of the big, big things that I just did not like about the car when it was done. We just spray painted it because we were trying to get it done quick and simple and it just never held up well. We kept making changes and cutting into it and repainting it and it was just a disaster. So another thing that I didn't like was the way the wiring ran through the firewall. It was very jagged cut because I did it while the wiring was in there. So we went ahead and pulled the dash out so that we could pull the wiring out uh, also to paint the bay but so that we could fix this hole. So we decided to cut the hole open so we could use a larger grommet. We got this amazing carbon fiber dash piece that a viewer sent us so while we had the dash out we were able to swap that piece on and then it was time to paint the bay so we decided to go with this jet black I had Adam who painted the car paint the bay for me so he painted the bay the same black as the exterior of the car just no flake nice and simple nice and clean he slathered a bunch of layers of clear on it to protect it as best as possible and we had tracked down an engine go pick up a new heart and uh what would you call it trans legs not legs abdomen doesn't matter we're gonna go pick up an engine and trans for the Miata. First stop is the trans. So our previous CDO9 had had a bad fifth gear. It just didn't want to go in, it grinded, it wouldn't stay in. So we picked up another CDO9 from a local record yard for 500 bucks in really good shape, low mileage. We then went all the way up to Lake City, which is about two hours away because we found a really good deal on an L33 there. Really wishing we had a forklift right now. <laughs> The deal was a little too good to be true because of course they had a core charge which none of the other prices I was looking at had a core charge so it ended up being the same as the more expensive one and when I took this intake manifold off we found a nasty surprise. I finally just said screw it, I'm tired of looking for the right one, I'm just gonna go buy an engine. I need to put an engine back in this car, I'm tired of waiting around, this one's a good deal, I'm gonna buy it. Then the core was expensive and then check this out, we pulled the intake manifold off and it's just like caked in mud like caked, like mud and leaves, and I pulled the PCV hose off and oil just came spitting out. Um, you can smell, I took the valve cover off and there's just gas all inside of it, like it's disgusting. If, if this was like sub a thousand dollars, maybe send it, you know, like clean it up, leak down test it, compression test it, but like Ben said, whatever this was in, it lived a hard life. So I'm gonna put this back together. All right guys, well, I was able to return the engine. With the engine returned, it was time to buy another. Hello and welcome to another episode of Junkyard Engine Hunting. Today we head to Orlando 
to find a prized, rare example. <laughs> so the reason this engine hunt was so hard was because we wanted to find an L33. So that's a higher compression, 799 head, which is a very good head, 5.3. We wanted to go with the 5.3 again like we had before. Our tune and everything would match up, our cam and spring. So tracking one down was tough because they only came in four wheel drive extended trucks in two years. The best thing about this engine is it's a cross between a Gen 3 and a Gen 4. So it's got Gen 4 rods and stuff, but it's Gen 3 electronics, which is simple and what we had and all of that good stuff. But they're in four wheel drive trucks, so they're usually usually pretty beat. So that that's the tough part about finding one. That's why it was taking us so long to track one down. We bought this one, which looked very clean. A little questionable when we got the intake off, but we pulled the rocker arms and valve covers off and looked at all of that, and all of that looked to be in good shape. So we are like, all right, well, let's dig into this thing a little further and make sure it's good. We got it out of the truck onto the engine stand where we could disassemble it and see what we are working with. All right, well, the engine appears to be in really good shape, honestly, for a used truck engine. Can't ask for much more. I'm as confident as I can be to throw it in. So now that we had an engine in hand, it was time to order gaskets and seals and all of that stuff. We needed to swap our stuff over and get the motor ready. So while we were waiting on all that stuff to arrive, we got our CD09 trans in and we're gonna swap everything over. This is an interesting comparison between a modded one for an LS and a stock CD09 off a of Z. So obviously stock, 350Z trans, bell housing, throw out bearing, clutch fork, etc. This is your T56 bell housing with the Collins Performance adapter plate, your T56 slave cylinder. Kind of see the major differences there. Cut the bell housing off, take this front plate off. We gotta take this bell housing off, unbolt this front plate. This front plate will go over here, and that allows to bolt the bell housing to it. And then we do the shifter. So cutting's the worst part. It's gonna suck the most, so let's knock that part out first. Cutting is most definitely the worst part. Luckily with these transmissions, the aluminum is so soft that with a decent cutoff wheel, you can zip right through it. So it's really not that bad, just a lot of dust. So once the bell housing is cut off, we can pull the bell housing and adapter plate off of our old transmission, get that swapped over to our new transmission, all sealed up, all torqued down, and then it is time to move on to the shifter. So the stock shifter sits way further back than we need. We need a shortened shifter like we have on the old transmission. So we take our GK Tech shifter off, we get it all cleaned up, there's a few mods you have to do to get these uh, shifters to fit. You've got to cut the selector rod a little bit just to shorten it up and then pop the new selector deal on, bolt the shifter on, and then the trans is ready to go. With the trans ready, we moved on to the engine bay. We 3D printed these firewall all the plugs, plugs. came out so good. We plugged they up the unused holes in our jobs. firewall. That was the so big thing with this car was heat and, over and them. air getting in. So on top of plugging up the unused holes, we wanted to use this gold reflective wrap so that we could kind of seal off some of the heat because I mean, any bit of a long drive on a hot day and you were just getting heat soaked in there and it was heat soaking everything else and heat is just bad. You wanna keep it away from the inside of the car if possible. So it also looks kinda of cool. It's just very difficult to make this stuff look good. I tried really hard to keep it from being wrinkly and it's, I mean, it's just not possible. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> we then drank coffee. Lots of coffee. <laughs> Moved on to our ECU mounts. I had 3D printed these and they didn't come out very well, so I decided to whip up some aluminum ones. I had a bunch of aluminum left over, so I just quickly and simply welded these guys up. You can see my broken, kind of crappy 3D printed ones because my printer settings weren't quite right. We got them in the car while the dash was out. We were able to bolt that down properly. We whipped up this little bracket for our ethanol content sensor. It had just kind of been dangling behind the engine and I put a lot of time into the small stuff on this and I wanted to keep that theme going. So we drilled our holes, made our rib nuts and mounted that all properly. With the ECU mounted and the wiring through the firewall fixed and grommeted, it was time to put the interior back together. So we got our dash back in our tombstone back in we got all of that stuff wired up and then it was just kind of the little stuff in the bay the bay is painted it's got the gold foil i mean it's ready to go so now we're just kind of slapping everything together we polished up our expansion tank we got that in we cleaned up some of our wiring we got our turn signals wired in we didn't have the fronts wired in and then the best news of all our kit our kbd kit was back from paint sandy what do you think of the kit sandy I was asking what you think of the kit. While Sandy wasn't too fond of the kit, I was. So I got straight to work on putting it all together. So we decided to use our factory bumper support in the rear to attach it because it's set up that way. So we just used some rib nuts and some bolts to get it mounted to that securely. Not too shabby. We got the factory bumper support installed. I just used rib nuts and these Allen headed bolts that I had. We then did the same thing with the front. Bumper brackets are swapped over. I'm hoping they're in the right spot. Bumper is officially installed. All bolted on. 
Corner lights in, hooked up, so I'm happy with that. I need to do the same thing rib nut wise for the rear just to attach this front part. With the lower and more aggressive rear bumper, we weren't gonna be able to easily get a jack under to our diff, so we needed to make a jack mount. So I took the factory tow hooks off, used that mount on the frame, drilled some holes in a plate and got it cut to shape. Then I took some leftover square tubing, cut it down to size, got it all tacked in there, and then started building out our jack point. So I TIG welded this. For me, it's like I really enjoy TIG welding, and any practice I can get to me is good. So, you know, yes, I could have MIG welded this, sure, but why not TIG weld it? Why not get some more practice and have a little more fun? I enjoy TIG welding. It's all welded. Most of the welds came out decent. They're nothing too special, but they're not bad. I uh, got a thorough coat of paint on it before we put it in. So now we're gonna pull the car off the lift somehow. So we're gonna roll it forward and then try to do the side skirts. Marco came over to give me a hand and we decided to mount the side skirts. So what do you think we mounted them with? If you guessed rib nuts, you're correct. What a shocker. <laughs> I really like using rib nuts for this stuff. They hold on really well and they're easy to take on and off. So we got those drilled in and mounted, got our side skirt bolted up and look at this. So we went ahead and just put the rest of the car back together. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We just put the hood on so we could get kind of the final look and man, I'm hyped. That looks sick. I hate how high it is in the rear right now, but I'm glad it's that high because we need it to be that high to get it back on the lift. I feel like you'll never drive this car aggressively again. Yeah, right. It looks so good. And if you do, everyone's gonna hate you. No, Yo, it'll be fine. A brand new kit. It won't get damaged, that's the point. Oh. It's indestructible. Oh. It might damage the paint and I might have to get it repainted, but it's not gonna break the kit. Dude, it looks freaking sick, man. Our jack mount paint had dried. Looks nice, came out decent. Yeah, it's like just above the bumper, which is where I wanted it. With the body stuff out of the way, it was time to move on to the cooling system. This is another really, really big problem we have with the car. It just didn't want to cool off. So we not only upgraded to some Mishimoto race fans, but we started building this aluminum shroud. So these shrouds are really important because if you just have the fan on the radiator, it's only going to pull air in that one spot. Whereas if you have a shroud like this, it pulls from the whole radiator. So we didn't have a sheet metal break. Sure, I'm sure someone could have sheet metal broke it for us and bent those ends, but Again, more seat time in TIG, the better. So I figured what a better way to practice than a freaking several feet of welding aluminum. So we got these welded up, enjoyed a nice toasty fire. Get ourselves a fast burner in here. Let her eat. It's a little windy. Fire died down a little bit, but we're keeping it going. Got my weather stripping on. Just as important as the shroud itself is sealing the shroud to the radiator. Otherwise, air will take the path of least resistance and come in the sides. So now I got my little tabs cut. We're gonna do Three on the top, three on the bottom, just so we can suck it tight up against the radiator to try to prevent any air from coming in the side. Mark them, tack them, weld them. So not the most elegant solution, but I decided to make these little brackets, weld them on, and then drill and rib nut into the fan shroud. We didn't really have any other good way of attaching the fan shroud to the radiator, which is obviously very important. So once we got that done, it was time to move on to the master cylinder. Our big brake kit from V8 Roadsters came with this one inch bore master cylinder. So it's a larger bore, which gives us better pedal feel. It's got separate front and rear reservoirs, so the brake systems are independent. You can bench bleed it from the side. It's got bleeder screws, which is super freaking nice. So we got that bolt it up we got our lines adapted on and we were pretty much done with that and it was time to move on to the heads so i needed to pull the valve springs out of my old head so that we could use them on the new engine so we started getting those pulled out as there is absolutely nothing wrong with them they're simply springs and they work great with our cam and why not save some money and reuse them so once we got them out we started stripping down our new motor getting our rock arms off getting our push rods out and all that stuff and once all that stuff's out of the way we can put our new springs in so you need to put air into the cylinder to hold the valves up so they don't fall down and when we did that we found a nasty surprise oh <laughs> we have 80 percent leak down you can see you can hear how much air is coming out we tried tapping the valves to see them i haven't changed the springs or anything yeah then i mean the numbers compare to the feel well, hold on put this back in watch this guys <laughs> yeah so i tried that helped on that one. Yeah, oh, that one's good. So that's only 5%. I mean, like, that's not great, but like, I mean, that's acceptable. So I'd already taken one engine back. I really didn't want to take another engine back, but now I'm having the dilemma of whether or not to take this one back and try to find another one. So to clear my head, more TIG welding. <laughs> Welded on the AN bungs to my valve covers so we could get our catch can set up on with nice AN line. 
And then I got to work on my handbrake assembly. If you guys remember from version one, we didn't have a handbrake and that's because I wanted to build this remote mount handbrake. There's not a lot of room in a Miata on the trans tunnel. So if you try to cram a handbrake there, it's gonna be in your way. I also needed to cover the large shifter hole opening because now our shifter has moved back and it's an even larger hole. So what I decided to do was build that plate and then build a handle and then have the reservoir remote mounted out of the way to try to keep things as clean and sleek as possible. So for the handle, I don't have a CNC mill. I was like, you know what? I'll cut four strips, I'll weld them together, I'll make this nice beautiful weld down them and you'll see the weld and uh, yeah, I'm not that good of a welder so the weld didn't come out as nice as I had hoped. So we just uh, ground it down, tried to make it look uniform which uh, also didn't come down as good as I had hoped. You're supposed to be a good welder or a good grinder, apparently I'm neither of those things. So once we got that done we realized okay this thing's pretty ugly. We drilled our mounting holes in it which we needed anyway and then decided to drill some six speed holes because holes make everything look better right? So we drilled a bunch of holes in it just to try to again make it look a little better because it was uh it wasn't very good. We'll just put it that way. We got our hardware in, we got some nylon bushings to mount it and all of that stuff and started getting that assembled so that we could test fit it in the car. Everything lined up with our bolts so we were good there and uh, it was time to build our final rod that goes back to our master cylinder, mount our master cylinder and then see what it looks like. Take a look at that. Check it out guys. Came out nice and clean. From here all you see is the handle and the rod sticking back. Like I said, we have carpet that's gonna cover this and it'll just be two slits for these tabs to come up. So you won't see any of the plate or anything. It'll be those two slits. Shift boot, we're gonna be removing the factory handbrake since we can't use it anymore. Um, so it'll just be a nice piece of carpet with the handle up and the rod going back. Should be very clean, very sleek. So now it's time for the biggest game changer of version two. This is one of those things that like the, the car nerd in me is just beyond hype for. So this is something I'm just super stoked for it. I'm very excited for it. So my old oiling system was just not adequate. I thought it might be. I wanted to give it a shot, but it just wasn't. And it was such a big setback to have that happen. We got a dry sump. Oh, so I, I just can't, I can't even describe how much this pleases my nerd self when it comes to car stuff. I always wanted a dry sump car because it's just the ultimate in an oiling system. It's basically the best insurance you can get that your motor is not gonna have any oil problems. The other big thing for me is that my pan hung down about this far below the subframe. So if I were to ever do anything like cut a corner too tight on a cart track or a road course and drop a tire off the inside of a rumble strip and smack the pan in the rumble strip, it's gonna obliterate it. To me, it just kind of was like a no brainer because this eliminates my ride height issue. Pan is nowhere near below the subframe. So with all of our dry sump pieces, one thing we needed to test was to see if our pan would clear our steering rack. So that was a problem before, the pan is really tight against the steering rack, so we got the pan test fitted on my old block. Me and Ben manhandled the block into the subframe so that we could see what our clearance was. We checked it out and all of the clearances looked good. It actually had more clearance than before, which is awesome. And then I got the pump test fitted on, so I wanted to make sure it was gonna clear my motor mount, lines were gonna clear stuff, and everything was gonna look good before we committed. But check it out. Dry sump, baller. Oh, this shit gets me so hyped. So while I was installing the dry sump on my old block, which I was considering rebuilding and taking this motor back, I there was some dirt in the threads where it mounts, and of course I tightened it down anyway, cracked the block so that forced our hand on keeping this motor and refreshing it. So the main thing we needed to do was just refresh the heads. So we pulled both heads off to check them out and see if they were bent valves or just pitted valves or just crud. Uh, looking at the first head, really not that bad. It wasn't that dirty and this was the sign that didn't have as crazy of a leak down. This side, however, real nasty, real dirty. That was the side with the bad leak down. We had pulled the valve out and checked and it was super pitted, which we expected. So it's time to send the heads off to the machine shop and get to cleaning the block. Easy peasy. We are just gonna start on a cleaning mission, basically. It should look gorgeous by the time you're done. Yeah, it should be mint. We need to paper towel up all the holes and then start, start cleaning. So we went to town on getting the block clean, getting all of the old gasket material off of the block deck and getting the pistons cleaned up of crud because, I mean, they were real nasty, real, real nasty. This is always such a satisfying project because you go from this just nasty thing to this thing that looks like it's freaking fresh out of the machine shop and all beautiful and pretty. So once we got it all cleaned up, we kind of compared the two sides so you can see just how bad the other side was. So this is obviously the clean side. This is the dirty side. You can see all the leftover gasket material. You can see, I mean, the pistons were just coated. You could scrape it off with your fingernail. There was so much crap on them. So 
Really, really glad we ended up pulling the heads off and getting this stuff cleaned up anyway, giving us a much fresher start. So we went and dropped our heads off at the machine shop. We were just gonna have them throw the valve springs in while they were cutting the valves and throw some new valve stills in so they are brand new heads, fresh decked and everything. Our secondary calipers are on back order, so we got those in and got those installed on the car and bolted up, which brought us one step closer to having a working handbrake on this car. We also got our center console to lead in so we could cut our carpet around our handbrake tabs, get it all fitted up and in place. We had ordered a shift boot, we got that in, we got it bolted down, we got the rod going back to the master cylinder painted, and our handbrake assembly was at least aesthetically done. We have a center console delete plate. We still gotta clean some things up, but I mean, this is basically what it's gonna look like, and this is what I had envisioned. So I was really, really happy to see it come to life. The next step in our handbrake extravaganza was getting our handbrake lines in and routed. So we had measured and figured out exactly how we were gonna do it to try to run them as clean and as neatly as possible. While we were waiting on a couple of fittings to finish up our handbrake install and get that all bled, we worked on making these brackets for our radiators. I was never really happy with how it mounted before, so we wanted to step it up a little bit this time. All right, that is that. Radiator is firmly mounted. It is not going anywhere, shake the freaking whole car with the radiator fan. So very, very happy with the end result. All solid, accessible, removable, installable, etc. So then we got an invite to go down to McFarlane Machining. So we pulled our pistons out of our block to get the block ready and went down there. Um, I've, I've heard there's like a special way to get in here. So let me see here. Wow. Oh. There you go. This is one of those rabbit hole things we talked about. I didn't really op want to open the can of worms of doing the pistons and the rings and stuff, but I figured, you know, while we're there, we might as well get it done, have a fully fresh motor, and I mean, who can turn down a dingleberry and party with Cletus and James? Might need a fresh dingleberry after this one. <laughs> She's only good for two uses. Oh, ho, ho. I mean, she's looking the head and the bone. Mighty fresh. Looking man. This thing's gonna make some power. All 350 horsepower fury. <laughs> Imagine it blows all the rings out at 350 <laughs> horse. <laughs> with our block freshly dingleberried and some new Hastings cylinder rings, I think that's what I want with Hastings. I don't know. Doesn't matter. We put our new piston rings on. Did I call them cylinder rings? Man, I'm really messing this up. <laughs> anyway, we got this uh, cylinder ring compressor. I call them cylinder rings again. Piston ring compressor machine piece it's a lot easier to deal with than the uh, universal one and they were just sliding in like butter so we've got freshly hatched cylinder walls we've got brand new piston rings we've got them all oriented the correct way we've checked our piston ring gap and everything everything seems to be good so we just start slamming it together and man th this is such a satisfying process putting a fresh motor together and i've done it a few times now with these motors so i felt really confident in it and we were just i don't know we were just jamming out with this process and just getting this thing slammed right together with all the pistons in, we got our rod bolts torqued down. All right, well, that is that, folks. Then it was time to move on to our cam install. So we had rescued this cam out of our old motor. It's our sloppy stage two uh, Elgin camshaft. So there was no damage on it. Everything looked great, tip top shape. I love the way this cam drives and the power it makes and where the power it makes. So we just decided to throw this guy back in. Another one of those things that I've done a few times now. So it is just cake. Even six months ago, me knows that it's cake. Cam installs in these engines <laughs> just ridiculously easy. Now we need to install our new cam plate. <sighs> our top dead center mark then we get our timing chain on and get everything timed up with our gear bolted down and all that also very easy so much easier than dual overhead cam engines get everything bolted down and torqued down to spec spin everything over to make sure it's all in time after a couple rotations that literally took eight minutes from start to finish counting moving the cam <laughs> so easy all right so now we need to install the lifters we've got them back in the order in which they were removed so the first step in getting our engine completely back together is to get our lifters installed, get our trays back in. This engine's new enough to where it comes with the updated lifters. Some of the older engines had lifters that were prone to fail and you want to upgrade to the LS7 style lifters, but ours came with them, so we didn't have to do that. Uh, then we get the block surface cleaned up and the head surface cleaned up just to make sure we have a really good seal. We used OEM AC Delco head gaskets. These are arguably the best gaskets you can get. And then it's time to get our heads on. So we get our head back on the block. Always a very satisfying feeling. Freshly machined heads, freshly cleaned up block, new rings, new head gaskets, all of that 
that stuff, all of it going back together just feels so good. Another thing we did uh, by advice of our buddy Derek is use the ARP Molly Lube that you would use on ARP head studs, but put it on the stock bolts just to help you get a more accurate torque reading as you tighten them down and keep them from binding up and seizing up and snapping or, again, giving inaccurate torque readings. So once that's done, we just torque our heads on and heads are on. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Throw the rest of the valve train back together. So we've checked all the push rods. None of them look like they're worn weird. We're reusing our rocker arms with the trunnion upgrade from our old motor. We get those torqued down. Man, I am being an adult with this engine. I'm torquing everything down. That is... It is very unlikely me, if you guys know me at all. You know, I normally don't torque things down, but we grew a little bit. So, we get our intake manifold bolted back on and ready to go. Get our steam port stuff figured out and back on the engine. I mean, this thing's about ready to go. The next thing we gotta do is put the pan on and start getting our dry stump stuff figured out. So, we got a bunch of fittings from Detworks. I had great luck with them on my fuel system, so I wanted to use them here. So, we test fitted some of those on to make sure we weren't gonna have any clearance issues with the subframe and the fittings, because, I mean, it is a tight fit around some of this stuff. So, everything was looking good. So, we moved on to mounting our dry stump tank in the trunk. So, I built this plate, welded these little tabs on, drilled holes, and riv nutted, of course, riv nutted <laughs> into the trunk area, got the tank and the vent tank mounted up and then got all that back in the car. Freaking dry sump set up in my Miata. So hyped, so hyped. Ah, oh, man, I just can't get over how rad that looks. Another odd thing with the previous rendition of this, nobody had really done a CD09 in this car with this swap kit, so my trans hung a little low, so what I did was just make some spacers to space the back of the trans up a little bit and bring it up a little higher. With everything test fitted, the pan test fitted, the fittings, all of that stuff, it was time to really finish up the motor to seal it up. So we need to replace this little aluminum dumbbell, so this basically diverts the oil flow and makes it go through the filter. If this leaks, it'll bypass the filter, in our case, with the dry sump, if that leaks, we're going to lose pressure. So it was very important we have a tight seal there. So I went with an aluminum one just to have, you know, a little bit tighter tolerances, a little better insurance since, like, again, that's going to be our primary oil supply. If oil passes that, it's just bypassing the engine altogether. So we do not want that. So we had to pull it off the stand to get to that guy easily. And while we had it off the stand, we did our rear main cover because there's no reason to try to do that on the stand. I've done it before. It is very annoying. We also torqued it down. Do you guys see this? Do you guys see me re torquing a rear cover plate down? That's crazy. That's next level stuff for me. <laughs> so then we get the engine back on the stand so we can work on the rest. We need to get our front cover on, our damper shell on, and get our oil pan on. So to do the front cover, one thing that's really important with this is the damper is what centers it. So we got to put it on loosely. Then we get our ATI damper hub on with the cog to run our dry sump. So this is a little nerve wracking because this is expensive. I didn't want to mess it up. We get it torqued down. All right, well, that was a relatively stressful part. I was slightly worried about just getting all this on correctly, but it's all on. Stoked. So it turned out we actually had the wrong hub assembly. We needed an F body one and it was like a Y body or a Z body. I don't know, kind of confusing. So we had to swap that out, but we got it swapped out. We were basically back to square one. Neighbor Al came by. I showed them <laughs> me messing with you with the drone and they said you were, you were burning bodies in your barrel. It's always helpful to have neighbor Al supervising. So we went ahead and torqued down the oil pan pans on man it looks so nice to see this engine all freshly cleaned up with the pan on manifolds dry sump pump fittings damper she's ready so now i gotta go wrangle the subframe out wrangle the engine hoist out and then we can install her so at this point, the motor's sealed up. It's ready to go back in the subframe. We're ready to put the trans on, put the accessories on, put all that stuff on. And you know what that means? Get it back in the car. So really, really big, exciting moment here. Popping it in the subframe after a rebuild feels so satisfying. All right, our engine is in the subframe. So now we are going to tackle these two lines. But the lines are done. There's the one, there is the other. This is another thing I was stressed out about doing, making these lines. I thought it was gonna be like impossible, but we managed to get it done with relative ease. So time to throw the flywheel on, pressure plate, etc. Yeah, about that. Just kidding. I uh, didn't realize that I couldn't get the pilot bushing out of the crank. So AJ went all the way down to Collins Performance, picked up some new bushings so we could knock this thing out that day. 
Now that we had our new pilot bushings, we were able to get our clutch assembly on. Then we moved on to the accessory drive. I wanted to do this once it was in the subframe so it wasn't so unwieldy. So one thing I did different on this is I used an actual clutch alignment tool to align the clutch and it made it worse. It always makes it worse. If I just eyeball them and try to center it the best I can by eye, it seems to work great. But as you can see, we are hella struggling with it. We pull it back off. It looks okay. It looks centered. So we use the drive shaft so that we can kind of spin the input shaft of the trans and get it to pop on and then we're good. And we bolt the bell housing on, get the starter on, and then it's time to put the engine in the car. There's two big challenges with putting the engine in the car. One is getting the rear bolts of the subframe to go in. Two, the biggest thing is the steering shaft. So that's been a struggle of ours the whole time. That steering shaft, it hits the header. It doesn't want to go on straight. We fight it. I had to pull the radiator out as well. I was hoping to keep that in, but you know, laziness didn't prevail and we had to pull it out. So anyway, drop the car down onto the engine that's the easiest way to do it drop the car down onto the whole assembly we get it to go in but we have the same struggles that we always have with the rear bolts and the steering shafts ben fights with it we end up pulling the column out and just putting the column back in the next day um, because it's easier to bypass the header that way all right the engine is in the car not without a fight man not without a fight there we go intake manifolds on check it out Woo, motor's done, let's fire up, let's do some burnouts. Okay, maybe we're not quite ready for burnouts, but with the big monumental step of getting the engine and subframe and trans back in the car, it's time to do all the little stuff. We've gotta hook up our power wires, put our radiator in, get that done and bolted up, get our brake calipers on, our suspension hooked back up, get our wiring harness rerouted and hooked back up to all of our sensors and our injectors and our connectors and all that good stuff, get our intake manifold actually installed correctly, not just set on the engine to make it look better so we can feel like we got more done get our throttle cable back on our coil packs our plug wires you know just all the little tinkery stuff to get this thing running again goal is to do the first start of the ls miata with its new engine with the dry sump everything before we do the first start though last project to do everything else is done the wiring's done the radiator plumbing i mean everything everything's hooked up if I weren't doing the dry sump, if I were to just have stuck with a normal oil system, that we'd be ready to start it up, fluids and start up. So we do have the one last thing to do, which is the dry sump. So obviously the, the pump is on, the tanks and the lines are made here from the pan to the pump, but we need to make our line coming from the tank into the pump, from the pump out through the oil cooler, figure out a place to mount the remote oil filter, and then into the engine, and then through the engine, back to the pan, back through these lines into the pump, and then it'll go back out to the tank. We went with all Deesh Works where we could. They only make up to Dash 10. Since they don't make Dash 12, we did have to source Dash 12 stuff from a different company. Got our Dash 12 line as well, also PTFE. So dry sump lines are on that list of things I was concerned about, something I didn't really have that much experience with, and I didn't really know how it was gonna go. So we just started tackling it. The first thing, the easiest thing was gonna be to do our high pressure system. So basically from the pressure side of the pump, through the cooler, through the oil filter housing, and then into the engine. So we start, we just start with one and move on. What I like to do is put a fitting on one end, route the line, figure out where it needs to go, and then cut it. Because I don't want to cut it too short and waste a good bit of line and have to take the fitting off and, you know, all that stuff. That's my method. I don't know. It works for me. So we just start hammering it out. We just start getting lines on, getting them routed, and move from one to the other. So we get our line to the cooler, out of the cooler, we figure out where we're going to mount our filter housing, which a lot of people gave me crap for mounting it this way it doesn't it's not that bad to do an oil change and there was freaking nowhere else to mount it so i didn't really have a choice so anyway we mount it there and we get all of our lines put in and made all right got the bottom line done the final line so yeah all of the high pressure stuff is done we go from the pump into the cooler out of the cooler up into the filter housing from the filter housing down up into the engine. Everything is in, everything is done. All we have to do now is the hard part. <laughs> oh God, we gotta do the uh, the main feed and return line. So cheaping out on stuff is always a gamble. Sometimes it works good, sometimes it doesn't. This line was PTFE line on eBay. It looked like it was gonna be good and you can see it's not. As we're routing it, it just starts kinking and just cracking and, and like binding up really bad. All right, well, good news and bad news. Good news is it really wasn't that hard to get the line back to the back and route it where I wanted. Bad news is as we got to the back, it started binding up and it got a little kinked and like it is, it is f like effed, like it's it's trash. Like I can't even get it back straight. Like this stuff is just pure junk. I mean, I should have known 
when I cut through it, let's go look at, like compared to the Detorx line. Yeah, you can see it. You can 100% see it. Can we bend this just to see? Like, look at that. It just crumples and then it's trash. So lesson learned, don't cheap out on AN wine. So we, we ordered some real good proper wine and while we were waiting on it to come in, we needed to make some plate covers. So basically this is gonna cover our bell housing area of our trans. Normally your oil pan sump would hang down there, but since there's nothing there, it's just wide open to rocks and debris. So we cut out a little aluminum plate for that. And then I was like, you know what? There's a lot of stuff under here that could get damaged. I wanna make sure I protect it. So we started building this skid plate. We had a bunch of leftover material from when we did our expansion tank. We had enough to build it. So why not? So we cut out the general shape. We cut out these little legs. It needs to go down further in the back. So we cut out these L brackets, cut out these little uh, basically support braces to give it some support if it does hit the ground, and then started welding those up, getting them welded together, and then getting them welded onto the actual skid plate itself. So like I said, there's the, the exhaust hangs down a little bit. So the back of the skid plate has to sit a lot lower than the front of the skid plate. But my thoughts are, you know, I'd much rather hit the skid plate on something than hit all that stuff on something. So once we get it made, it's time to drill our holes and mount it. So we just drill holes and mount through with the subframe bolts in the back, drill our holes into the subframe in the front so that we can throw some rib nuts in there, throw some M10 bolts in there, and we got ourselves a skid plate, boys. All right, skid plate is done, all mounted up. We've got about a quarter inch of clearance. Let's see if I can show you guys. Yeah, see, there's like a quarter inch of clearance between it and the face of the bell housing. So it shouldn't rattle against it. Maybe not even a quarter inch, like an eighth inch. I'd rather hit this on stuff than hit everything else. So, well, I went ahead and added two more bolts to the skid plate just cause it was bothering me and it seemed jank having the three only and having the sides kind of hanging down. When I first got the car done, I'd pretty much only been street driving it. So one thing that was annoying on the street was how loud and droney the exhaust was. At cruising speeds, it was so droney. So we tried, decided to put this bigger resonator in. I decided to weld V-bands on both sides so I could, you know, maybe run that on the street and then do the same V-bands on a straight pipe section, throw in a straight pipe if I want, throw in a softer resonator if I want. We end up changing this several times, but this is rendition number one. So once we get all that bolted up, our exhaust finalized and bolted back up, it's time to run our new feed and return dry sump lines. Got the final line ran from the valve cover all the way back to the tank. Got the grommet in for all the lines, so we don't have to worry about them rubbing on stuff up there. I need to tuck them down and get them finalized wherever they're gonna be, and then start cutting them and putting the last fittings on, putting the fittings in the tank. Etc. So we're on the home stretch, guys. All right, we finished up the two lines. Man, it looks so sick just seeing these. These 120s are like the perfect radius for what we're doing and where the lines are going. Um, oh man, it just looks so baller. All right, breather hose is done. So it's time to fill it with oil, try to prime it. We got it to prime. It was a, a little tricky at first. We were spinning the pump with the electric ratchet and get it to prime. It wasn't sucking down the oil. Lifted it up and held it up here. I spun the pump, we got oil, we got oil all the way back. So we think we're fully primed, we're gonna spin the engine over, quickly start it, and then shut it off immediately if, uh, if we don't see pressure. Serpentine belt on other than the dry sump belt, but the freaking dry sump works! It works! It works fine. It primed. It freaking works, dude. <laughs> Bless you. Hyped. Hyped. That was like my biggest concern of this whole thing. And then obviously first start up on an engine you put back together yourself, like that's a big moment. You know, you don't know. You don't know if you mess something up or like I honestly kind of forgot about that. I forgot that I rebuilt this engine. I was yeah, thinking shout out to McFarland Machine yeah, for the right honing work. Right. Great honing. I wish we had the vacuum gauge hooked up so we could see how much vacuum it's pulling, but I'm sure she's a ripper. Ah, it runs. It started right up. Right, I mean, we forgot the coil packs. But other than the coil packs, started right up. Like first, brum. Amazing. Is that Matt good? Happel sloppy mechanics didn't want tune. What? Nothing peeing oil. Nothing peeing oil, nothing peeing fuel. We have 
two puddles. You guys are probably gonna notice these. One is from when, <laughs> when I, uh, I left the fitting out of the oil filter to make sure we were getting oil all the way to there. And then this one is this fitting wasn't tight. I don't know why it wasn't tight. I don't know why I didn't tighten it, but it wasn't tight. So with the biggest hurdle of the dry sump done and working, it's time to finish up the last few things and finally take this thing for a drive for the first time since it's blown up. Oh, also I got my gauge in. So this is my oil temp. We're just making sure everything's good and it goes up so we can trust it. So we got coolant temp, oil pressure. This is the sound with the resonator. So didn't have time to put body panels on. I'm gonna try to use the, the, the last bit of daylight, dusk, whatever, to go drive it. We got the oil temp sensor in, so we can make sure our oil's up to temp before we rip it. I mean, I think we are ready to go. So we're gonna go. Yeah, did you tighten that? Well, as you guys probably saw by the GoPro footage, that did not go as planned. We managed to find the intake, but uh, this is why you don't rush when you do things. All right, that's where the intake air temp sensor would be, which it ripped the pins out of the connector. Luckily, they're still intact, so I should be able to just slide them into another connector. But I need to get a new IAT, a new intake. So we had this C5 intake lying around. It didn't work well, but it worked enough to get an intake back on the car and go drive it again, and we found our problem. Yeah, we were definitely running on seven cylinders that whole time. <laughs> All right, well, other than needing to order another AM, um, wideband sensor and needing to trim up the fender area in the front and like probably a few other little things like it's done the miata is is done basically i mean it it rips it runs great it was definitely running on seven cylinders the first drive and the second drive which explains it because the first drive i was like man this just doesn't feel as fast and that's kind of what i was focused on when the intake went flying in my face one of the coil pack plugs just wasn't in all the way which is probably my fault because I think when I first started it up, I was pulling them just to make sure it wasn't missing anywhere. And I probably just messed that one up and didn't get it in all the way. But yeah, I mean, didn't skip a beat. Great oil pressure all the time. Great oil temp, great coolant temp. Everything worked. Just look at this thing. Would you just look at it? I'm just so, I'm just so happy with it. I'm just so happy with it. This is like, I don't know. I guess dream car is kind of like a broad stroke and a big word. It's like saying I love you, but I, I don't know. It's just like, I've done everything that I wanted to do to this car. I've done everything the way I wanted to do it. I didn't cheap out on anything. Like I sucked it up. I saved the money. I spent the money on like all the stuff that I really wanted. And I took my time and all the little bits that like I wanted to come out nice. They were as nice as I could make them. And like, it's the first car I've ever really gone that far with. Normally I'm like, ah, this is good enough. Like slap it together. Um, whereas this car like took the extra time and it, I don't know, it's just so rewarding. It's so satisfying. And I'm just so happy with the end product. I love this profile. Like you see the lips and you see the kit and you see the carbon fiber dash piece and the seats. Ah, oh, just so happy with it. So happy with it. So now that the car was done in terms of driving it around, it was time to get it ready to go drifting. So one thing we needed to change was our rear spring rate. We needed to go to a much softer rear spring rate to get weight transfer to the rear and get as much grip as possible. And another big thing before we messed everything up was to clearance our front section. So our tires were hitting on our bumper and they were hitting on the side skirt. So we cut as much out as we needed. We tested, we cut, we tested, we cut and made sure that we weren't going to have any clearance issues in the front. And once we had the new rear spring rates on, the car was a little too low in the rear, so we had to make some more race ramps to get her on and off the lift. But, you know, price you gotta pay to stun, I guess. <laughs> Ooh. 
With all the prep work for drifting done, it was time to go test it out. So we went back to our abandoned neighborhood, tried it out, and we had some struggles with it, man. We were fighting it. You can see I'm, I'm really uncomfortable. And I thought, you know, okay, I, there was an issue with the front spring rate being a little too soft. So I was like, I'll bump that up. And, you know, I was like, I haven't really drifted this car yet like this. And this is a narrow, you know, sketchy neighborhood. So that's probably part of it. But we were having fun anyway. We were enjoying it. We were getting to at least drift the car and see kind of how it felt power wise and also see if our oil pressure was holding good. So we kept an eye on that and that was all solid. And, you know, we had to end it off with a good old third gear Bernie. I mean, who wouldn't? You got a V8, might as well do a third gear Bernie. So with our initial drift testing complete, we made the necessary changes we thought we needed to make so that it would drive better and work better, and then it was time to head to our first drift event. All right, we are loaded up and ready to head out to the Miata's first actual drift event. So our first drift event did not go as planned. I had changed some things up. I put a stiffer front spring rate on it, and man, it just didn't feel right. Like you can see, I'm super struggling with the car. The the steering's just all over the place. I can't, I just, I can't get it to self-steer and feel smooth and confident. It's just not right at all. God, it still feels wrong, man. I didn't want to give up on it that easily, so I kept trying. I'm like, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm used to the Z, and you can see I am just on a struggle bus, man. Come on! Do a nice little uh, anger burnout coming out of here with the pure frustration from trying to figure this out. And I've been making changes this time. You know, I the toe was off. I changed that. I'm changing tire pressure. I'm changing this. I'm changing that. This thing drives horrible, horrible. Like it is. Uh, I know that it's not going to self steer, and I still, still cannot get it to freaking transition. Like it still drives like shit. So I made more changes and took Chrissy for a ride. Uh, what did you think? What did you think? It's great. Does it feel better to you? I can't tell. So the problems weren't as noticeable on the oval track because it's not a very technical track. There's not a lot of transitions. Once you get the car in drift, it really didn't feel that bad. And this one slow sweeping transition across the middle, you know, you end up walking the wheel anyway. So it wasn't a really good test of if the car was better or not. So I went back to the middle to try it again. And you can really see how bad it is and kind of what was wrong. Yeah, see, like, watch the wheel. It just doesn't turn. I tried once again on the skid pad with the little, like, dead tires to see if the lack of grip would help. Made it worse. Oh, come on, man. So we had set my caster, it was seven degrees, we thought it was good, but we added more just in case, you know, just to try it, just to see if that was the problem. I had tried so many things at this point that I had no faith in this fixing the issue. <laughs> Adam's riding with me so he can see how bad this is. I'm just trying to see, we added some caster, I'm trying to see if it helps, watch. Okay, it's kind of turning. See, just watch, watch the wheel. Now watch when I try to transition. What's funny is at this point it was actually better, but I was so in denial that it could be because I tried so many times and thought it was better and it wasn't better. So I keep trying and keep messing around and I started to realize like, oh, okay, I think that helped. I just want to try to do like another figure eight. It feels better for sure. Yeah, no, it's way better. It's like drivable now. So the real test was the skid pad. So we got in line for the skid pad, went out to do a lap, and we're very surprised. God, this thing has so much grip. Oh, it's way better now though. Time. The whole thing was caster! The whole time was freaking caster! 
All I had to do was check the caster. Should have maxed it out from the beginning, but I thought I had six and a half degrees. So I was like, maybe it's too much, but this should be right. So the car was way better. It wasn't at 100%, but it was much better. There's a way to add some more casters. So the plan was just finish out this event because there's like a couple hours left, enjoy it, and then add some more caster for the next one. But regardless of any of the issues, this was an amazing experience. Finally tandeming this car, having a car with more power and more grip, and it was just so awesome and such a great feeling. That's what I'm talking about. That's what this car is meant for. Hell yeah. So we got the car home, we properly realigned it, we added some more caster, and I thought, this is it. This is gonna solve the issue. It's pretty drivable for it. This is gonna make it work completely. And uh, not quite. You can still see that the steering is not very responsive. It's not steering on its own like it should. Like you'll watch when I come through this transition, it just kind of stalls out. So I was thinking about it, I'm like, maybe this is just it, maybe this is just the way it is, you know? But there was another hunch we had about the problem with the car. The steering was very heavy when the car was in the air. So we thought, okay, maybe something's binding. And I decided to just dive in and figure out what the hell it was. So we ended up having to remove the boot, basically, that's at the firewall, bend this bracket over, which was previously bent over, pull the header out, regrind the header down, grind the steering shaft down, and all of those things combined gave us clearance. So we were, we were binding on the rubber boot at the firewall and we were binding on the header. So now that both of those are fixed, there's no more resistance with the steering shaft connected versus disconnected at the wheel. We still have some resistance at the ball joints, like even with the tie rods completely disconnected, it's still kind of stiff, um, but it's, it's a million times lighter right now than it was. So. Um, obviously I want to try it out, maybe go like do some Mexico donuts and just kind of see how it feels. Uh, but I mean, it's kind of a huge relief. So this was an issue we were fighting not only with the way the car drove, but putting it together. Anytime we had to take the engine out, take the steering rack out, anything like that, it was such a pain to get the steering shaft to go back in because it was binding and misaligned. So this was a huge, huge thing to fix. So we took her down to Mexico and gave it a shot. Is it fixed? Is it not? So with the car fixed, I was raring and ready to go to the next event. I was so excited to drive the car without the issues that we were having because the lack of cell steer made the car so difficult to drive. So, you know, we had fixed everything we knew and would think of. So now it was time to see if it was actually gonna drive like it should. Holy shit, this thing is fast. Right? That was such a sloppy run because I didn't, I was trying to see how the steering felt. freaking works it's amazing and man boy was it amazing like finally being able to drive this car comfortably being able to drive smoothly being able to get close in tandem without feeling like on edge the whole time and really feel this car that i had dreamed of being such a great car based on how they drove and how they work actually be what it was meant to be you know this was a big moment it was such a letdown when it drove like crap and then now it's finally finally driving good so me and ben go back to back we tandem me ben and huffman i mean my tires are sparking i don't care i'm just sending it i'm just having fun my car is finally working So the Oval at OSW has always been one of those things where it's not very fun in a low powered car, you're just kind of like doing everything you can to stay in drift, but it's always been really fun in a high power car because you go from the skid pad where you can't really open the car up to a track where you can just mad it in third, fourth gear. So I'm like, man, hell yeah, got this thing working right, I'm confident in it, I don't feel like I'm going to die every corner, so let's take it out on the Oval and have some fun. I made one grave mistake when I decided to go one more time. Can I go again?
It's not what you're thinking. I don't crash the car, but I lose power steering right about here. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. That's kind of odd. So I'm turning the wheel. I'm thinking, okay, is it the pump? Is it this? Is it the belt? Then when I thought belt, I thought, oh, dry sump belt. I look down, no oil pressure. So I didn't know when this happened. I didn't know if this happened, but when I started drifting on the bank, if it was halfway through the bank, what? I had no clue how long it was driving without oil pressure. I think my dry sump belt fell off, which means I had no oil pressure. Are you kidding me? No. But I turned it off pretty quick, so we might be okay. <sighs> Shouldn't have done one more. So that ended our night early. We got the car home and inspected what happened. And basically the problem was our serpentine belt slung off and that was when we lost power steering. And I kept driving because I was thinking about what it was. While it was slapping around, it got caught on the cog for the dry sump belt, knocked that belt off. And then as it was slinging, it caught the pulley of the dry sump, snatched the dry sump over, twisted the dry sump and cracked the block where it mounts. You can see that crack, which ended up being a crack all the way around. So... Now we gotta fix that. So we just got straight to work on it. I mean, I finally got this thing driving right. I'll be damned if I'm gonna let this thing sit for a month or two while I pull the engine out and fix this or get a new block. I'm gonna fix this thing. I'm gonna fix this block. So we start tearing apart the front end on it. The goal is to be able to do this without pulling the engine out because obviously that's a can of worms I didn't wanna open at all. So we start pulling everything out, water pump, radiator, power steering pulley, get the dry sump, pump like unbolted and out of the way so we can inspect the damage and see how bad it really is. All right, well, there's part of our block. And there's our block. So we got the pump off, got the oil cooler out of the way, got pretty good access to it. Not as good as it could be, but definitely not bad. I don't think pulling the motor out would get me much better like angle of attack at it. So then it was time to start welding it back together. So the plan was to weld the broken piece uh, back on. So we work on getting that done. We've got a bolt in there to try to keep the thread straight. We've got it clamped in as best we can, but I mean, it's a tricky spot. And then I wanted to add this brace here as well, just to give it a little more support in case this happened again and just in general. All right, we got her all welded up. <clears throat> what I did was I threaded the bolt in with the piece that was cracked. I clamped it to where I could thread the bolt in and out welded that up and then I cut this little plate and I welded it on. For welding in the car, I'm not ashamed because it was it was pretty tough. So then we ran into another major problem. I went to put the bolt in and things didn't go well. When I went to bolt the actual pump on, I got it to the point where it was getting tight and it just got tight, got tight, started slipping at about probably 10 foot pounds or so. And I was like, no, like the threads pulled out, no. So I took it all apart and I looked and the, the bolt's just too short to go grab all the good threads down in the back. So I got a longer bolt, threaded it in, we got tons of thread engagement, probably a solid inch of threads and it got super tight, I cranked on it, it was good, we're good. So, it was a crisis averted man, like I was, I was freaking a little bit, I was freaking. That would mean pulling the entire engine out to helicoil it, to put it back together, you know, put the engine back through. I am very happy. I am very stoked. Alice Miata is officially back together. It is done. I'm stoked. So with the car patched back up, it was time to take it drifting. And this time we went to Palm Beach International Raceway. So this is gonna be our first like road course in the car. And this is kind of what we built the car for, being able to go to a fast road course and have the power to really bake the tires off. You know, I've never driven a car here that had good power. I drove my Z with like a stock engine. I drove my Vet with a stock engine and no handbrake. So this is my first time going to this big, fast, fun road course with a powerful, capable car and my first time driving my powerful, capable car on something like this. So this is really cool and really exciting.
So the car performed flawlessly. We didn't have really any issues at all. We drove the whole night, no problems. We went home, we just went through a lot of tires. And the next time we drifted it, we went and took Cletus out. So Cletus wanted to learn how to tandem. I took my Z out, we tandem with his Vic and the Z. And then I had Ben driving the Z and I was tandeming with him. So I was tandeming with my own car, which was really cool. We did this cool thing where I got super close and he was able to slap the car. That's always like a super hype, exciting moment. I also got my first door tap in in the Miata and that was funny like door tapping my own car with my own car but it was really cool to get to that comfort level in the Miata finally where I could door tap another car. car was feeling great so I decided let's do a uh, oval run and let's try to get ourselves nice and high on the wall if the Orlando had just happened I was feeling inspired oh. Oh my he didn't even take a lap he was just out there This guy, wow. So I was like, man, this thing's pretty dialed. It's working well, and Adam was doing Pro 2, Matt was doing Pro-Am. I was like, screw it, you know what? I wanna go to Texas, I wanna go drive in Texas some more like I've done before. I've never taken my own car out there. Let's take this thing out there, let's run Pro-Am. So this is the event the week before. This is kind of our final shakedown. Make sure nothing's gonna break on the car before we tow it a thousand miles to, to go to Texas and go drifting. And you know, the car's feeling great. It's feeling really dialed in. So But unfortunately, towards the end of the first session, uh, ran into a little bit of a problem. I go to make this turn here and realize I don't have power steering. Now the last time this happened, my belt flew off and cracked my block and snatched my dry sump, so I freak out, I turn the car off, I try to coast back to my pits. I don't make it to the pits because there's cars in the way, so I'm like, alright, I guess we'll just stop in the middle here and see what happened. Pop the hood, expecting carnage, and uh, the belt's oh. still there. That's interesting. That's weird. Huh. So I go try to drive some more. I try to drift and I realized that in drift it was kind of working, but as soon as the RPMs dropped down, you could see that it yeah, was like I manual it steering it again. So the yeah. pump was bad. Power steering pump's dead. Better to happen there than in Texas, right? So we start getting this thing ripped down and doing the things that we need to do before Texas. We need to go through and nut and bolt the whole car. Another big thing I wanted to do was put extended wheel studs on. I had one that was always pretty questionable. I also remade my e-brake handle. The one I had was starting to bend and it was getting a little sketchy. So we made this new metal one and 3D printed a knob and loaded up and headed out to Texas. So I went into this with very low expectations. I just wanted to win a battle or two and see how the car did and really put it through its paces and figure it out. And uh, man, we, we found ourselves in the final battle for first place. The car was feeling super dialed. By this point, our shifter was falling apart and was barely working. So we ended up starting in third gear. Other than that, the car was doing great. I had my nerves under control and we were just having a blast. Round three of Lone Star Drift at the Houston Police Academy is Taylor Ray. Congratulations! Thank you so much. 
It was pretty crazy to go from barely being able to drive the car to it doing exactly what I thought it would do and being the car that I thought it would be and performing the way I thought it would and doing that so well that we were able to win our first ever Pro-Am competition. I mean, what a big, big thing for me. I mean, it was just amazing. And uh, yeah, we just kept driving it. We go to this uh, event, me and Ben are shredding. I'm feeling more confident in the car than ever, more confident than I felt in any other car ever. But of course, as usual, we had some steering issues arise. Our steering rack well, basically like broke a tooth off one run. I just noticed that it was like binding up. So we pulled the steering rack out. The reason for that was I had backed the lash out to try to make the steering softer when we were having that issue and there was just too much play. So it broke the rack. So pulled the rack out, changed the rack. This was of course right before Texas again. So we get our new rack in, we get everything else sorted out and figured out and make sure the car is all good and ready to go. And then it's time to go back to Texas. So this time, we do not have a car advantage. Our car makes 350 wheels. A lot of cars here making six, seven, eight hundred horsepower, and we are on a very fast track. I'm talking 110 mile an hour fourth gear entry. So I went into this one with very low expectations too. I didn't expect to do very well, but I just like driving with the Texas homies and having fun. So that's, you know, that's what we went out there to do. Coming out of the first battle, I'm driving around in the pits, and my car has the same problem that we had the event before this when we broke the steering rack. And I'm like, how did I manage to break a steering rack? I had gotten into a hit with Zach. I thought maybe that was it. And it was basically like almost like worse than manual steering to the right and okay to the left. You know, and, and I was like, man, I'm here. I can't bow out of this. I got to at least try. So I tested the car because I followed first on my next battle and it was it was drivable. It was locking up on the center section and it was super wonky and super inconsistent and super sketchy. But I felt confident enough that I wasn't going to hurt myself or anybody else. And yeah, here we go. This is just to give you a good reference of how fast this track is. Somehow, despite the odds, I found myself in the final battle again on a track where I didn't think I would even get past one or two battles. This was really cool because I had a hard time believing it the first time. I thought, you know, it was a fluke. I got lucky. My car was perfect for the track, etc. So to be able to do it again back to back really proved to myself that I could do it and that my car was capable and that it it was as good as I thought it would be when I set out to build it. So we get back home. I changed the rack again and th th two laps in the same freaking things happening. So I'm like, there's no way it's the rack this time. So I did some further inspection. I put a ma magnetic filter in there to catch any contaminants. And I was like, maybe that's restricting flow. So we took that out, put just a normal barb fitting in there, like a union fitting. And it was pretty much fixed. You could tell the pump was going out. It was cavitating really bad at like high RPM through this section and doing some other weird stuff, but it worked. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll change the pump again. So obviously we're doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. It's not gonna happen. We need to change our steering setup up. But I just went ahead and threw another pump on there just so I could go to Texas, just so I could drive, which we ended up not being able to go because I was having tow rig issues. But regardless, we got the new pump on there and we redid our exhaust. So our exhaust had fallen off the first time we went to Texas. Second time we went to Texas, we got rear-ended and it bent our exhaust. So I redid it again and I made it a straight pipe this time because we'd put the resonator in because we were street driving it. Now we're not really street driving it. I like it being louder for normal driving. So we deleted the resonator portion, just made this straight piece. And then we had a three to four inch adapter to go to a four inch 45 tip because the opening in the exhaust is really big and the three inches didn't fit in there. So the four inch looked a lot better, sounds a little cooler and all in all, 
Should hold up a lot better? We'll find out. Aside from the steering, we've been pretty lucky mechanically, so we're moving on to fun stuff like bodywork. We're doing over fenders to get a little more room for bigger tires and lower offset wheels. We also want to just have something that we can take off if we do damage it. You know, if we do hit somebody, we can just replace the fender. So we went ahead and got those on, obviously with rib nuts, of course. Why wouldn't you use rib nuts? <laughs> and then we do a wing. So the rear bumper kind of is what it is. This KBD kit is really nice and durable, but this is really the only rear bumper option for these cars besides the stock one. So I'm not a huge fan of how low it is, but you know, we wanted to get the wing and the over fenders to kind of complement it and uh, make it look more correct. Like make the top of the rear more aggressive to help with the bottom of the rear's aggressiveness. All in all, I'm happy with how it turned out and how it looks. So that is pretty much where we're at with the car now. That's the end of version two and the current status of the car. So the one, I mean, pretty much the main last thing, I don't wanna say this because I'll jinx myself and there'll be way more problems to contend with, but the main last thing that we need to take care of on this car is the power steering issue. We're still having power steering issues. I put a new pump on it just the other day, new filter, cleaned everything out, and now it's still feeling notchy, especially at idle and giving us some issues. So there's a couple options, a couple routes, electric, like a hydraulic pump, um, electric column, a better normal power steering pump or manual rack, but that's pretty much the last thing that really needs to get dialed on the car. We've kind of worked through all the other issues. The dry sump's working phenomenally. The engine runs really good and, and has tons of power and feels great. The tune's good. I mean, I might change the ECU to like a Holley Terminator setup just to have more adjustability and more options, but for the most part, the car is really at a pretty good spot. I'm really, really happy with it. So. Uh, let me know what you guys thought of this video. Let me know what you thought of version two. Do you like it? What would you change? We're going to be going to Pro-Am again in a couple weeks, so make sure to check that video out. It should be a lot of fun. If you haven't seen the other Pro-Am videos, they're all really cool. Finally getting to use the car in a competition format and, and find out that it really was a weapon in competition. So if you haven't seen those, check them out. But that's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Wow. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Thank <laughs> you.